so let's talk about lab testing for copper. If we're going to lab test for copper, one of the things you can't do is run serum copper. This is a very, serum copper is very misleading as a marker for copper adequacy in the diet. Number one, serum values of nutrients, any, for most nutrients, are a reflection of your last meal and not a reflection of long-term storage or long-term adequacy. So if you didn't eat any copper or didn't eat enough copper yesterday, you got tested today, you could show up looking like you have low copper. If you ate some oysters yesterday and you came in to do your test today, your serum copper might be elevated even though your storage of copper might be too low and you still might be copper deficient. So serum is, is misleading. Now, one of the other caveats to serum is if the level is high, this is sometimes a marker of systemic inflammation. So elevations in copper in the blood don't necessarily mean you have copper toxicity. They can actually just mean that you have systemic inflammation. So this is just, again, why serum copper. And again, a lot of doctors, they don't know anything about nutrition. Uh, they, they've taken less than seven hours of nutritional coursework. They have no clinical um, acumen whatsoever when it comes to nutrition. And so all they're doing when you're asking them, hey, can you check my copper, is they're running to a little book uh, in their office and they're looking this up and they're seeing this test, which is the most common test, the serum copper, not knowing that it may be very inaccurate and may actually just be an indicator of chronic inflammation. And if you're sick and you're asking your doctor to measure your copper and you have chronic inflammation and this comes back high, they may tell you that copper deficiency is not your problem when in fact it might very well be. The best way to measure copper, um, ceruloplasmin, which we just talked about a minute ago, is a protein that carries your copper. And so this is how your copper gets distributed through your bloodstream is this protein right here. So this is a better way to look at copper status, um, red blood cell levels of copper is a better way. But the best way is to look at something called lymphocyte proliferation. This is a type of, of um, storage of copper inside the lymphocyte. Now, that what's unique about using this type of assay is the lymphocyte has a six-month lifespan. And so when you're getting your copper levels checked, you're seeing an average over the last six months. So your last few meals are not going to directly impact measuring this. So this is going to be more an accurate reading for your long-term storage of copper. So in essence, this is what we want. We don't want to use, you know, something that could be misleading. These other ones are fair, but not as good. So, you know, I would say if you're asking your doctor, ask him to do all three. If you really want to be thorough, look at all three of these things and check these out. Now, uh, I want to make a mention because many of you right now are probably using high levels of zinc. Zinc is one of those nutrients and during cold and flu season that everybody generally t just tends to take more of and it's important to understand if you're on zinc if you're using zinc and you're taking more than 50 milligrams of zinc a day this can contribute they compete it contributes to possible copper deficiency it doesn't mean if you're taking zinc that you're guaranteed to get a copper uh, deficit but 50 milligrams of zinc over long periods of time contributes to possible copper deficiency. And you just need to be aware of that because if you're going to stay on high levels of zinc over periods of time, you, you again, get with your doctor and have him measure ceruloplasmum RBC levels or lymphocyte proliferation levels of copper to make sure you're not creating a problem. Now, what some people do is they take, they take zinc and copper together. So you know, one of the questions I sometimes get is what's the, the ratio of zinc to copper? So if you're, you know, it's 10 to 1 and, and zinc on this side, the 10, and then copper on this side. So if you're looking at kind of taking them both simultaneously, a 10 to 1 ratio should kind of help to reduce the risk of this. But some research says 7.5 to 1. So it just depends on which research study you read. But these are kind of the general numbers in essence, if you're taking a lot of zinc, you might want to consider copper. This is actually 
Uh, a lot of people are scared of copper because they've been misled. They've been told that copper is dangerous. Um, it's dangerous only in certain rare conditions. There's, you know, like Wilson's disease. If, if Wilson's disease is a genetic disorder, Minka's disease is a, is a genetic disorder of copper toxicity, and they're extremely rare conditions, not common at all. And so um, those, are, those are conditions where your body can't properly metabolize copper, so toxicity of copper can occur in your brain and your liver sometimes occurs in the coloration of your eyes and you can get bands around your eyes that are copper colored uh, called Kaiser Fleischer rings. Those are not uncommon to see if somebody has Wilson's disease, but for the average person without a genetic uh, defect or, or a genetic problem, uh, zinc, zinc copper ratio or even taking supplemental copper, not real dangerous. As a matter of fact, most studies show to get copper toxicity, you have to be taking it a really long time and you have to be taking 500 to 600 times the RDA recommendation. Now, safe level of copper, very safe level of copper for, for supplementation for most people is two to four milligrams a day. And this is for an adult, not for a child, but two to four milligrams a day is a really safe range. If you're gonna do this though, again, I always recommend testing. I always ask for the testing because um, you don't want to just take copper just for the sake of taking copper. You want to take it for a reason. And if we can isolate and identify what that, if that deficiency is a reason to get in extra copper beyond what the diet might provide. So very important. Now I want to talk about one other thing with copper and that is Medicines, medicines that deplete copper. This is a big one. So many of you might be on certain medicines and this is where you wanna, gonna, gonna wanna know um, who's, who should really be looking at measuring copper based on, on medic, prescription medications, right? So number one, if you're taking anti-seizure drugs, so if you've been diagnosed with epilepsy or if you're on an anti-convulsant medication, these, these drugs we know can deplete copper. Number two, certain antibiotics can deplete copper, especially antibiotics that are used um, for, um, antibiotics that are used for um, tuberculosis or TB. Sorry, I had a many, many mental laps there for just a second. So antibiotics that, that are used to treat TB. And then we also have, if you've got a diagnosis of HIV and you're taking an anti, or rather a retroviral drug, so a, a, an antiviral drug for HIV, those drugs can, can, can also deplete copper. Additionally, beyond that, probably these are, somewhat less common, although seizure disorders are becoming more common. Um, what's probably the most common that I see is antacids. Uh, antacids are very common cause of copper deficiency. And one of the reasons why is to properly absorb copper. If you're gonna absorb it, that's gonna require acid from your GI tract. And then once you have the acid breaks the copper off of the food substrate and then it is absorbed into your small intestine. So your small intestine absorbs copper. Um, and so that's very important to understand that component, especially if you've got inflammation in your small intestine or if you have a history of antacid use in many of you with gastroesophageal reflux disease or you've been told you had a hiatal hernia and they got you on antacids because of that. You know, you're just basically, you're, you're depleting, potentially depleting your copper the longer you're taking those medicines. If you've got inflammatory bowel disease, you might not be absorbing the copper from the diet. You might be getting adequate copper, but you might be malabsorbing it. So it's important if you've got celiac disease, gluten sensitivity, uh, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, uh, esophagitis, uh, stomach inflammation, any of these intestinal or, or GI tract rather inflammatory conditions could be a, a reason why you might be malabsorbing that copper. And again, it's not the, it's not the short-term copper deficiency that you wanna be worried about. It's the long-term copper deficiency. 
Um, micronutrient deficiencies generally don't have a rapid onset. It's not like one day you had plenty and the next day you're completely deficient. These deficiencies generally work kind of like the death by a thousand cuts is if you're doing something like what we've got on the board here, you know, fast forward six months, fast forward six more. Now fast forward two, three, four years. These are when the symptoms start showing up it, because your body is resilient. It's going to try to adapt to better absorb. It's going to try to adjust to get that nutrient that it needs. But at a certain point, it's going to start to falter. And that's what can take a number of years to really fully develop. And because most doctors don't look at, especially in, in, in first world countries, they don't, they don't look at malnutrition as a problem. If you're not you know, on the, in the plains somewhere of Africa or India where there's, where there's massive malnutrition from starvation, they really don't consider Americans to be malnourished, even though Americans are probably some of the most malnourished individuals in the world. We have plenty of calories that we eat, but we just don't have the nutrient density. So you're not getting the nutrients in those calories, and that's why we're so malnourished today. So at any rate, let's dive into questions. Let's see what we've got here tonight. So, hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.